Before we start, I want to tell you about a free online event on the 12th of January, Wonders of the Arctic, Science on Top of the World. In this event, biologist and new scientist podcast host Roan Hooper, that's me, will talk about some of the uniquely adapted wildlife of the region and discuss how humans could refreeze the ice in the Arctic Circle, as described in his latest book, How to Spend a Trillion Dollars. We'll also hear from glaciologist Dr. Uliana horodisky Pena, who will describe the melting of the Arctic ice and tell us all about the life of a scientist in such an extreme environment. And the event is free. Go to newscientist.com slash arctic event to sign up. Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly and the first podcast of the year. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to 2023. I'm Rowan Hooper. Now, we all know that going back to work in January can be a bit of a chore, so I thought we'd set ourselves up nicely for the year ahead and have a preview this week of all the interesting things we've got to look forward to. We're going to highlight some of the things from science that we'll no doubt cover when they actually happen, but also lots of cultural highlights too. So to go through all of this, I'm joined by New Scientist reporters Madeline Cuff, Jason Murugesu, Michael LePage, and by Space and Physics News Editor Leah Crane, and by our Books and Comment Editor Alison Flood. Welcome all! Hello! Hello! Hello. Hi! Okay, Leia, what are you hyped about for 2023? Well, there's two really big launches that I'm excited about this year. Two big planetary science missions. The first one is called JUICE, and it is going to my very favorite planet, Jupiter, Mm -hmm. to study some of its moons, which are, I think, more fascinating than the planet itself. Yeah. So JUICE means Jupiter's icy moons, right? That's what it stands for? Yeah, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Right. Right. So it's going to orbit Ganymede, which, although it maybe isn't the most interesting, it's really big. So it's easier to get into orbit around it. Mm. But it's also going to visit some of the other moons. I'm particularly excited about Europa, which we know has a liquid ocean under its shell, and really study some of these moons that we think have water on them, but we're not entirely sure. Okay, so it's launching this year. I I guess it's going to take quite a while to get to the Jupiter system. Yeah, it won't get there until 2031. Right. Um, It takes quite a while to get into a stable orbit. Yeah, but uh, it's going to be a good launch. It's going to be a good thing to watch. Um, And what about Psyche? Because I reported on that. I went to the University of Arizona a few years ago and saw the the mission there as it was being developed. Um, That's launching this year. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that is launching this year. It's going to get to the asteroid it's going to in 2029. The asteroid is also called Psyche, which is a little bit confusing sometimes, but it's a really interesting, weird asteroid because it seems to be made completely out of iron and right. have basically no rocks on it, just yeah. iron. Um, and we've never seen anything like that before. And researchers think it's probably a planetary core that got its sort of rocks and the rest of what would have been a planet stripped away. Yeah. So it's a really unique opportunity to study this sort of baby planet middle of a planet type thing. And that's in the asteroid belt, isn't it? So it's between Mars and Jupiter. Yeah. So it also takes a while to get there, but not quite as long as juice. I know lots of um, sort of asteroid mining (laughs) fanatics get very excited about Psyche, but we're not going to be we're not going to be doing any mining of this uh, (laughs) this mineral rich asteroid, are we? This is just no go and look. You know, we've got Plenty of iron on Earth, um, mm. so there's not really it's cheaper a reason. to get it from here for now. Yeah, yeah, it's way easier to get it from here. So mining psyche isn't really a thing that we're going to do, but scientifically, it's really interesting to look at the sort of building blocks of planets and the core of a planet. Yeah, without all the other stuff. Yeah, totally psyched for psyche to launch finally. <laughs> um, and apart from these planetary missions, um, there's some actual human spaceflight stuff going on next year as well, isn't there? Yeah, there's a bunch of big rockets launching for the very first time that are sort of earmarked to take humans into space sort of beyond the moon later mm. on. Mm. So there's several big rockets launching. Of course, there's going to be human spaceflight flight. SpaceX is planning on making its first trip around the moon with some space tourists aboard. Overall, it's going to be a really exciting year for rocket launches. Is it just coincidence that we've got all these heavy lift rockets from different companies all becoming flight ready in the same year? Because they've all been they've been years in development, haven't they? Yeah, it 
it really is, I think, basically just coincidence and the fact that it takes so long to get these things ready that many of them have been delayed a gazillion times. Yeah. And they all happened to be finally getting there this year, we hope. It's possible that they'll be delayed further, but hopefully everything will go this year. Yeah. And tell us about Starship in particular, because if people haven't seen it, it really is a spectacular looking rocket, isn't it? It's really crazy looking. It's very sci-fi. It's yeah. a big silver tube. It looks kind of like a grain silo. Watching it sort of hop off the Earth, because that's all it's done so far. It hasn't yeah. gone into orbit. But watching it do these little hops feels nuts, because it feels like there's no way that thing should fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to. I mean, it's exploded several times in tests. Yeah. But <laughs> hopefully it stops exploding now. And watching it go to actual space is going to be wild because it, it's really going to look like a grain silo flying into space. It, it, it's really going to be something special and incredible when that happens. I mean, I over so. the years, we've said in January, we've often said when we've done previews, it's the dawn of a new era of human space flight. But I mean, with all these missions going up, it, it really is this time, right? <laughs> I think so. And I, I think... I think it sort of was all the other times too. I think <laughs> the dawn of a new era takes takes a few years. Yeah. Um so I think we're sort of in it now and and we're working all the kinks out and eventually hopefully we will be in that new era and space flight will be really regular and and easy. But I think the dawn of the new era is something that lasts a decade. <laughs> Thanks, Leia. Uh, Michael, let's go to you now. Well, you've been looking yeah. at what we can expect in terms of new COVID vaccines this year. Yeah, so just to recap, the various vaccines, especially the mRNA ones, have been a huge success. They've proved extremely safe and they've probably saved millions of lives. But the trouble is that the virus is evolving and it's evolving to dodge the protection from the vaccine. So we are going to need new vaccines in the future. Right. So what's in the pipeline? Well, there are two really exciting things that researchers are trying to do to make vaccines better. First of all, they're trying to design vaccines that give us protection against all the potential COVID variants that could evolve, not just one like the current vaccines. That basically means targeting parts of the virus that don't change. And the second thing they're trying to do is to make vaccines that are much more effective at preventing infection and also transmission. The idea here is to increase immunity where we need it most in the mucosal membranes of our airways that are first exposed to the virus. So what this means in practice is that we'd have a vaccine that's delivered to our nose, say, rather than injected into our arm. Yeah, we heard a bit about this um, over the last couple of years, haven't we, nasal vaccines? Um, when are we likely to get these? Well, actually, India's already improved an intranasal vaccine and mm. China has approved another mucosal vaccine that's delivered by breathing in particles from a nebulizer. But it's not yet clear if either of these vaccines really do boost the mucosal immunity. It's, it's a hard thing to measure directly, so it might take some time to, to see how well these vaccines work. And then even if they do work better, regulators in Europe and North America are going to be very cautious about approving vaccines that are delivered in a different way. So they're going to want to see lots of safety evidence before they approve them here. Mm. And then, then there are lots of teams working on these universal vaccines, but unfortunately, most of these are still at the animal testing stage. Right. So, Michael, just to be clear, for our preview of what we've got to expect in 2023, you're saying we're not going to get any major new COVID vaccines this uh, year. I'm afraid that's uh, yeah the, the, the disappointing thing. So we could see more boosters updated to tackle specific new variants. But in 2023, we are unlikely to get significantly improved vaccines. I mean, researchers are telling me that it could be done if we pulled out all the stops. But the sense of urgency that we had a couple of years ago is gone now. Right. But I think it's sort of important not to become complacent. I mean, COVID is still causing a huge burden of disease around the world. And there's a risk that that could actually get worse rather than better as the virus continues to evolve and dodge the existing vaccines. Maddie, let's turn to you now. You've been looking at a big showdown in the world of deep sea mining, um, and that's going to come to a head in July, isn't it? 
Yes. So just to recap for our listeners who Mm. aren't aware, deep sea mining, because it hasn't actually happened yet, but it's a long held plan that essentially means companies could go onto the the seabed of the deep sea and harvest these mineral rich nodules. They're shaped a bit like potatoes and they'll have scoop them up off the sea floor. And from that extract minerals such as manganese and cobalt, which you need to make things like electric vehicle batteries. Right. So countries have been talking about how to enable deep sea mining for about 20 years now but they haven't really got anywhere about how to regulate this but as we all know demand for technologies like electric vehicles have really shot up in the last few years so there's now a lot of pressure on countries to decide actually how we're going to regulate this new industry so it's coming to a head in july because Essentially, one of the mining companies that wants to get involved in this space, they're called the Metals Company, teamed up with a tiny Pacific Island nation called Nauru, and they invoked this pretty niche clause under a UN treaty known as the two-year rule. So that that was invoked in July 2021, and it gave countries around the world two years to decide what they were going to do about deep sea mining. So to set up all these regulations that will govern the environmental impact of this industry. Mm. And if it's not all agreed by July 2023, i.e. this year, then it seems like, and there's a bit of legal dispute about this, but it seems like companies can go ahead with deep sea mining even if there are no rules in place. So we could see mining start by the end of this year without any environmental protections in place. Right. And uh, and then it would be a total Wild West. Um, give us a flavour of, of just why it's so controversial. Lots of marine scientists are opposed to it because they fear that, that it will do untold damage to the deep sea, which is seen as one of the last great wilderness areas of the planet. It's only in the last few years, really, that we've even been able to get submersible crafts that deep down into the ocean floor to see what's there. And there are new species being discovered every mm. other week, it seems. Yeah. So there's a real fear that this will kind of turn the deep ocean into an industrial zone. What mining companies would say on the other side is that we need to get these minerals like cobalt and manganese to power the great green industrial revolution that we need to fight climate change. And perhaps scooping them up from the ocean floor is better than trampling through Congolese rainforests. Yeah. So this kind of tension is really coming to a head. And at the moment, countries are battling out whether to proceed with deep sea mining in the first place and whether to agree to these new regulations by July. It's looking pretty unlikely that the rule book will be finalized by this summer. And then that raises the question, well, what happens next? Will mining go ahead with no rules? Will there be a huge fight about this? What will the metals company and other companies like it do? So it's really kind of watch this space. July will be the really big showdown where we find out actually has deep sea mining got a future? Wow. Yeah. So that is going to be massive in July. But on the more positive side, let's look at Brazil because we've just seen President Lula take power on the back of a promise to halt deforestation in the Amazon by 2030. Yes, so this is a rare bit of good news for the environment Mm. beat. We've got President Luna now in power, taking over from the far right, Jair Bolsonaro, who was his predecessor. And it has had a pretty immediate impact, to be honest, on the future of the Amazon. So almost immediately after Lula took office at the beginning of January, Norway, which is one of the co-founders of the Amazon Fund, which has been frozen since 2019, that Norway said, the Amazon Fund is now live again. You can start spending the money that has accumulated in it. So this mm. was a fund that was originally set up by Lula when he was president previously, but was suspended under Jair Bolsonaro because Bolsonaro abolished the governing board and all of its action plans. <laughs> so now this fund is kind of back in business and it releases about $620 million for the Brazilian government to spend on protecting the Amazon rainforests. And as deforestation hopefully starts to fall under under Lula's governance, more money will be released from donor countries. So it really kind of kickstarts that kind of global action to help save the rainforest. Time for a quick break. Save 50% on an annual digital subscription in our January sale and let science guide you on your journey forward. Become a New Scientist digital subscriber and you'll receive unlimited access to over 50 new articles a week on newscientist.com unrestricted access to the New Scientist app, including our Essential Guide series, free online events brought to you by world-class scientists and experts, our weekly Editor's Highlights newsletter exclusive to subscribers, and access to free accredited courses from New Scientist Academy. All of this 
for just £2.25 a week in the UK or just $1.92 a week in the US. Go to NewScientist.com to take advantage of this January sale. Okay, we're back. And Jason, you've been reporting about work that, well, it's going to accelerate the creation of synthetic embryos. So that's when researchers coax normal cells to become eggs or sperm and then develop into an embryo. But first off, is this in human cells? Is this going to be in humans? Yes. So um, some of this research is in human cells, but there is this rule which means that no human embryo can be studied in a lab past 14 days. So that means researchers who want to study the embryo in more detail in vitro also work on other species like rodents. For example, in one study last year, the researchers devised a synthetic embryo of a rat that could live to eight and a half days. It had signs of a beating heart. And also, yeah, researchers are also trying to produce rhinosperm synthetically in order to save an endangered species. Right, okay, so there's very good reasons to do this. So researchers are allowed to study natural human embryos for up to 14 days. But so far, no one's figured out how to produce synthetic embryos that can survive that long, not not really much longer than a week, right? So what about synthetic human embryos? Are people actually trying this? Well, yeah, um, this isn't in the story I wrote, but one group told me that they actually have created a synthetic human embryo model using human stem cells. That research should hopefully be published later this year. Wow. Whereas another group told me that they've created artificial placenta-like cells belonging to marmosets. Again, that research should be published this year. All this research will change our understanding of pregnancy in the earliest stages of all our lives. Wow. Um, so in the UK, this is all regulated by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority. And the main rule there is that, as we've said, you can't go past the 14-day period to work on human embryos. Um, the other is that it can't be used to help establish a pregnancy in anyone because we just don't know it's safe. But are these rules likely to change? Um, Yes, basically. Um, The HFEA told me that they plan to launch a consultation this year with the aim of updating embryo research regulations. Whether that includes extending the 14-day limit, we won't know until after the consultation. Wow, so that's something else that we're going to learn about this year. That's So it's a really, it's another sort of step change potentially for the field this time, this year. Um, Yeah, definitely. Ultimately, all this research will change society. These researchers are working on studies that may eventually lead to a cure for infertility and even ways for same-sex couples to have biological children. Mm. It's important and exciting work. Okay, look, we're going to pivot to some cultural stuff now. Alison, it's looking like a bumper year, isn't it? Should we start with books? It absolutely does look like a bumper year. Um, first off, I'm really excited about a February novel from our own columnist, Annalee Newitz. Mm. Their new science fiction novel is called The Terraformers, and it's set tens of thousands of years from now, following an environmental ranger who is working to terraform a planet and who discovers a city full of people who shouldn't be there. It's already got a glowing write-up from our sci-fi columnist, Sally. I'm also Mm. really intrigued by the sound of Sandra Newman's Julia, which is a retelling of 1984 from the perspective of Winston Smith's lover, Julia. Newman was chosen by the Orwell estate to write it, but there's another spin on the subject next year as well from Catherine Bradley, whose The Sisterhood is pitched as a feminist retelling of 1984. The original has recently gone out of copyright, so perhaps we need to get ready for a lot of takes on George Orwell. (laughs) Definitely. What are you looking forward to, Rowan? (laughs) Uh, Well, I've been reading a book um, by an author called Martin McInnes called In Ascension, and I'm only about, you know, a third of the way through, but I'm very excited about this. It's about a marine biologist who researches the origin of life, and she joins an expedition and exploring a a deep trench in the Atlantic and all sorts of mysterious things happen. I'm very much enjoying it. I I think we're going to come back to this on the pod. Uh, That's out in February. What else is on people's lists uh, for books? Jason? Um, I've got Saving Time by Jenny O'Dell, her first book about um, digital minimalism and bird watching. yeah, which had a big impact on me. And then this book is meant to be about circadian clocks and how the internet affects our relationship with time. Okay, so we're, we're pitching now to a non-fiction. Um, Maddie, what have you got? I'm really looking forward to reading um, Sadiq Khan's climate book that's coming out in May called Breathe. 
I haven't mm. seen a preview of it, but it sounds really interesting. It's kind of part practical guide to tackling the climate emergency, plus some inside information on what it's like to try and run City Hall and a bit about his motivation for tackling this issue. He was di- um, Steve Combs was diagnosed with adult onset asthma when he was 43 while he was training for the London Marathon. And he kind of blames London's poor air quality for that diagnosis and has since done quite a lot, um, including expanding the ultra low emission zone around central London to try and clean up the capital's mm. air quality. So I'll be interested to kind of see his take on, on tackling climate change. Yeah, um, I didn't know he had a climate book out. I'm looking forward to that as well now. Alison, what other stuff in nonfiction are we looking forward to? I mentioned our science fiction columnist Sally A.D. before, and I'm really looking forward to her book, uh, We Are Electric, which explores the bioelectricity of our bodies, what happens when it goes wrong, and what the Mm. implications for our health are if we can control or correct it. That's out in February. I'm also looking out for Naira de Gracia's The Last Cold Place, about her experience studying chinstrap penguins for a season in Antarctica, which is out in April, and to Ross Mitchell's The Next Supercontinent. He's a geophysicist, and he is looking into what the future supercontinent of Amasia, defined by the merging of North America and Asia, might look like, and that's out in May. Wow. Uh, So that's a deep future one. (laughs) Um, Leia, what about your cultural highlights? So I haven't read anything that is yet to come out this year, but I have been reading, which came out last year, this book called Babel, which is about Mm. uh, sort of a fantasy world about translation. And uh, it's incredible. I haven't been this sort of zoned into a book in a while. (laughs) Yeah, I I devoured it as well, actually. Inhaled it. Yeah, it's incredible. And I'm also really looking forward to the sequel to Chuck Wendig's Wanderers. Um, which also just came out last year, because the first book, while it was about a pandemic that takes out most of the world, which was, you know, slightly disturbing to read, was really engrossing. I'm really excited to read the second one. Okay, let's talk about some film and TV stuff now. Uh, Jason, do you want to start us off? Um, yeah, uh, mine's a pretty basic choice. It's uh, Oppenheimer by Christopher Nolan. Yeah, mm. big new Nolan film looking into Robert Oppenheimer, the man who created the atomic bomb. Yeah. yeah. I'm just very excited for it. Yeah, I'm excited by this. Always excited with a Christopher Nolan film. And I saw that he'd he's filmed the scenes of the atomic bomb exploding, but he hasn't used CGI. <laughs> and also he hasn't used nuclear weapons. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be something to see. Alison, what about stuff that you're looking for to watch? Telly-wise, I really can't mm. wait for the adaptation of Lessons in Chemistry, which is out in March. I really loved Bonnie Garmus's novel. It's about Elizabeth Zott, who's a chemist trying to make a career in the male-dominated world of the 1950s. She ends up as a TV chef, kind of, mm. without really meaning to, but she's always longing to get back to science. It's really heartwarming and funny. And Brie Larson is going to be playing Elizabeth. That's on Apple TV Plus in late March. And I'm also looking forward to the adaptation of Liu Shishin's The Three Body Problem by Netflix. Mm. The books were brilliant and they moved from first contact with an alien civilization to the end of time. So <laughs> there should be plenty to cover. And it's being done by um, the Game of Thrones creators, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss as showrunners. So I think it should be pretty good. Uh, I cannot wait for this because, they, yeah, as you say, they were extraordinary books. What about films? Well, film-wise, I would say that we were all left hanging by the end of Dune Part 1, so I'm looking Mm. forward to seeing Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet back in Dune Part 2 in November and hopefully seeing some proper sandworms then. And um, another kind of science fiction-y one, I like the sound of 65, in which Adam Driver crash lands on a planet, which turns out to be Earth 65 million years ago. It sounds like it could be fun, if maybe a bit silly. That's out in March, and at the very least it will have dinosaurs. Uh, I am duty bound to point out that that 65 million years ago there were no dinosaurs on Earth because yeah. they'd been they'd been wiped out 66 million years ago. <laughs> well, perhaps the they will tackle this problem, or perhaps they just yeah. why didn't they just call it 66? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they they're all the best films I think coming out, and just two that I wanted to mention, <laughs> bit silly ones, but um, Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, <laughs> that's uh, obviously full of quantum madness. And Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. So this is the sequel to Into the Spider-Verse, which I just thought was the best Marvel film ever made. Michael, what are are your picks for this year? 
Well, I, I wanted to sneak in a mention of Avatar. I mean, I, The Way of the Water. I, I know it's out already, but it's a film I've been looking forward to for a really long time. Mm. And I think the reason I really loved the original Avatar film was uh, it betrayed an alien world that makes at least some sense in biological terms and, and most of all it's got evolution in its heart that you can you can look at the different animals and see they've got the sort of similar characteristics that they evolved um, from the same original species yeah and so knowing jane cameron's love of the sea i expected where the water to be even better and i wasn't disappointed i think it's by far the best depiction of alien ecosystems in any movie bar none mm. great i will go and see that um what about this year though well, uh, look, coming on, moving on from films and going on to games, I think what I'm really looking forward to is a game called Horizon Forbidden West Burning Shore. So this is uh, a game where basically you, you run around sort of killing robot animals, including sort of giant sort of uh, robotic T-Rex-like creatures. So it, all, it all sounds a bit silly, but actually it's it's got a great narrative. The original game was called Horizon Zero Dawn. Horizon Forbidden West came out last year. Now there's sort of an update to it called Burning Shores, which is going to be set in Los Angeles. And if it's half as good as the others, I'm going to be spending a few hours playing it. Great. That's it for this week. What a lot of lovely stuff we got to look forward to. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to guests Madeline Cuff, Jason Murugesu, Michael LePage, Leia Crane and Alison Flood. And thanks to you for listening. And we're back as normal next week. See you then. Bye for now. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.